Hello, everyone. I am Chris Hyam, CEO of Indeed, and welcome to the next episode of Here to Help. At Indeed, our mission is to help people get jobs. This is what gets us out of bed in the morning and what keeps us going all day. And what powers that mission is our people. And most weeks, Here to Help is a look at how experience, strength, and hope inspires people to want to help others. But once a month, we bring in a guest from the outside to help shed some new light on what it is that makes people tick. And I'm very excited to introduce our special guest for today's episode, whose work centers on how we learn and how we think. Annie Murphy-Paul is an acclaimed science writer whose work has appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Scientific American, Slate, Time Magazine, and the Best American Science Writing, among many other publications. She is a best-selling author of several books, the most recent of which is The Extended Mind, The Power of Thinking Outside the Brain. Her work has radical implications, not just for how we think about ourselves, but for policy, for architecture, education, community, the economy, and notably for, indeed, jobs. Annie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for inviting me on, Chris. I'm really pleased to be here. Let's start where we always start these conversations by asking, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing I'm doing really well, actually. I just came back from a spring break trip with my two sons to Florida. We had a great time. We rented a convertible. And when we got back to Connecticut, where I live, the spring had kind of started while we were gone. So I'm feeling pretty good today. Fantastic. Well, um, let's start with just an overview at a high level of your work. So uh, you're a science writer. You are the author of three best-selling books, The Cult of Personality Testing, Origins, and most recently, The Extended Mind. How would you explain the focus of your work and what interests you? Yeah, well, you know, I think it might seem um, at first glance like my three books are unrelated or on, on very different topics, and they are, but in my mind, they're really all about the same thing, which is this question that has always deeply interested me. Um, I think the way, best way to put it is, wh wh why do we become the people we are? You know, how is it that we become um, the human beings that we are today? And with that first book about personality testing, um, I wanted to challenge one of our culture's most, um, you know, popular and common kind of um, uh, answers to that question, which is personality. We are we are what our personality is, and in, and in fact, we can measure and we can test and measure that personality. Um, and I was skeptical of that idea to start with, but I, I you know approached it with an open mind. Um, it ended up the book ended up being a cultural history and scientific critique of personality testing. It, it did uh, give personality testing a hard time in the sense that uh, I think most of these tests are not valid uh, measures of, of anything much. Um, but I also found it extremely interesting that the history of, of who created these personality tests, how they were shaped by their own times, their own generation, um, and how their personalities, in a sense, were, um, oh, gosh, sorry meant to turn off that that uh that notification um how their own personalities shape the tests that they that they um that they created for others um the, my second book origins is a hist is a um is about the science of prenatal influences um and that too was a, a an attempt to look at um it, it was an attempt to be a sort of fresh take on this nature nurture question you know that's another way of looking at how do we become the people that we are? Is it nature? Is it nurture? Um, that's been a debate that's been going on for a long time. It seemed to me that um, between that moment of conception, um, when the genetic blueprint gets laid down, you know, nature, uh, and the moment of birth, when we imagine that nurture, parenting starts happening, there were these nine very consequential months um, that we hadn't really paid enough attention to. And so that book was about a, a, a field called the fetal origins of health and disease that argues that um, many of our the conditions that afflict us later in life uh, have their start in, in the nine months uh, in the womb. So then the, my most recent book, again, I think um, takes on some of the assumptions of our culture about why we are the way we are. Um, you know, our culture tells us that intelligence is like a lump of stuff that's sealed inside our heads, that it's it's fixed, it's innate, it's measurable, it's rankable. 
Um, whereas the extended mind argues that our thinking processes and therefore our intelligence is something more like a, a quantity that's uh, dynamically assembled moment to moment from the raw materials that we have available in our environment. So that to me was um, a really intriguing idea. And it's one that um, became the, the kernel of this latest book. Great. So let's dive into the extended mind. And um, and I recognize that it takes an entire book to really cover all of the topics here. But can we start at the highest level with just this idea of the extended mind? What is what is that principle and that that metaphor there? Sure. So the the theory of the extended mind, I borrowed that actually from it's not my idea. I borrowed it from two philosophers, uh, Andy Clark and David Chalmers. They wrote an article in 1998, uh, in a, in, published in a philosophy journal um, that introduced the idea of the extended mind, and their first, uh, the first, very first line of that article, when I when I read this article many years later, many years after it was published, um, the first line grabbed me right away, um, and that line was, um, "Where does the mind stop, and the rest of the world begin?" And that was a provocative question to me, in part because it would seem to have a conventional answer, an obvious answer. You know, the, the mind stops at the skull. The mind is identical with the brain. Uh, but Clark and Chalmers were saying, were arguing, no, that's not the case, that actually the mind extends beyond the skull. It extends uh, into the rest of our bodies. It extends into our physical environment. It extends into our relationships with other people. And um, what they focused on most intently in that article was it extends into our devices, our technologies, our tools. And we actually um, offload our some of our mental functions onto these extra neural outside the brain resources. And when we do that skillfully and intentionally, we can actually think better. Um, so that that um, that's where that idea came from. And, and uh, I'd be happy to elaborate more on it. But that's that's the basic idea. Yeah, so I think I think we're probably going to take the next thirty minutes just trying to unpack that that first idea. Uh, let's start with uh, with a book, uh, a story that you tell in the book about an event that occurred in in nineteen forty six at the Moore School of Electrical Engineering. And if you can just share that story and and what you identify as the implication of how we understand ourselves or think about ourselves. Yeah, so that that was. Um... That event that I write about in the book is was uh, really the introduction of the very first computer. And when we think of computers now, we think of our compact laptops. But this was a gigantic room-sized computer called the ENIAC, and um, it it you know compared to today's computers, it couldn't do a whole lot. It could um, carry out um, arith you know um, mathematical of um, equations very quickly, um, and it, it it could supplement. Um, what were then known as computers, they, but they were com human computers. They were teams of, of humans who were carrying out these, um, these calculations. Um, so it was a big advance from the point of view of uh, the war effort. Um, but the, the you know, possibilities for, for uh, post-war um, development were clearly there as well. Um, so what's so interesting about the creation of, of this first computer is that when you look at the news coverage of, uh, and, and many reporters were invited in to, uh, from the, the country's major newspapers were invited in to see a demonstration of this amazing uh, new machine. When you look at the news coverage um, of, of the ENIAC, um, all the articles uh, called it an, an electronic brain, an amazing mechanical brain. You know, they were all they were all likening this um, gigantic machine to a brain. Uh, that was the metaphor that they reached for. And what's so interesting is that very quickly that got turned around, such that we, uh, meaning American culture, um, American scientists, and then the rest of us, the American public, um, and people all over the world, were referring to the brain as a computer. It's like we, you know, human beings created this machine and then we likened ourselves to it. And that's important because um, this brain as computer metaphor has become so pervasive. So, um, you know, it infiltrates our language, it infiltrates our thinking in ways that we're not even always aware of. Um, but it really, uh, from the extended mind point of view, it misses so much about what makes it in humans intelligent. You know, it's many of the wellsprings of our own human intelligence, as opposed to computer intelligence, arise from the fact that we do have bodies, that we are embedded in physical spaces, that we are 
uh, profoundly connected to other people, you know, and and yet this brain as computer metaphor sets all that aside and looks at our human brains as almost second rate computers, you know, and I think that, that that's uh, that's a mistake that, as I say, cuts us off from the sources of our own human intelligence. And so that's why it's time to sort of revise our metaphors um, for uh, for the brain. Yeah, so you, you spend quite a bit of time talking about these faulty metaphors. One of the other metaphors that you describe is that people think of the brain as a muscle, for example, which it's also not. But but you introduce this idea of a, of a different metaphor of the brain as a, like a magpie. Um, can mm -hmm. you explain that? Because that's a, it's probably not something that anyone who hasn't heard that before has ever thought about the brain. But <laughs> how does that help us understand how we actually think? Yeah. Yeah, so um, what's intriguing about magpies, you know, uh, 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 the species of bird that are related to crows. So picture a crow, um, a black, a black bird. Um, what's what's um, intriguing and interesting about them is that they are well known for taking bits and pieces from their environment, you know, shiny bits and pieces, um, not just uh, twigs and straw, but um but things like wire and um, coat hangers and eyeglass frames and croquet wickets and chopsticks and anything they can find in their environment, they pick up those bits and pieces and they weave them into their um, into their nests. And so, if we're to think of the brain as being like a magpie, that moves the focus away from the brain as the sole locus of thinking, this the only place where it happens, and says, no, actually. Thinking happens in this gathering and weaving process. The brain is drawing on its the raw materials in its environment, just as the magpie draws on whatever it can find in its environment. And we weave those bits and pieces into our trains of thought, which means one of the many implications of this shift in metaphor means that the quality of the raw materials that the brain has access to now really matters in terms of uh, how well we can think. It's not just a matter of... Um, what goes on in here, but what goes on out here. So as a science writer, you know, people are drawn to all kinds of different uh, areas of intellectual pursuit. And, and if you were writing about physics, it would be fascinating maybe for you and for us to understand a little bit more about the physical world. But can you talk a little bit about how understanding the brain and how it works, how it's more than just intellectually satisfying? Like how does it actually help us as humans to have a better understanding of how we work and and how we process information and how we make decisions and, and live together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, our culture is really dominated by um, uh, a conception that I'm going to borrow again from Andy Clark, one of the um, uh, creators of the uh, of the theory of the extended mind. He says that our culture is is a very brain bound one. In other words, our our ideas about where and when and how thinking happens are very brain bound. They're they're restricted to the brain, um, and so um, that means that our ideas about uh, education, about workplace training, about management, these are all very brain bound in the sense that we think of doing that when we think of doing those things, we think of cultivating the brain, cultivating the ability of the brain to um, to solve problems, to learn, to understand, to um, to come up with creative ideas. Um, but if we open up that kind of brain bound notion and admit all the possibilities and all the avenues that are opened up by the extended mind, then all of that looks very different. You know, then the role, for example, of a teacher or a manager or a leader becomes something more like creating situations and contexts in which people can think instead of uh, trying to to um, operate on the brain. You know, um, instead of trying to to cultivate the brain, it's more about looking at what's outside the brain. Uh, again, looking at the quality of those uh, raw materials, but also um, thinking about how how much people know about how to use them. You know, I've argued in the extended mind that we all really we all need a kind of second education. You know, we get one education that's in using our brains, but we need a second education um, in how to use outside the brain resources, because although we're all thinking outside the brain all the time. I mean, we're all obviously running ideas by colleagues. We all gesture. <laughs> I gesture quite a lot. We all, um, uh, 
arrange our workspaces in particular ways. You know, these are all aspects of the extended mind. We tend to do so in a kind of um, haphazard and an unintentional way. We're not really thinking about it. We're not really informed in the way that we do that. So um, I, it's my contention that we actually need to uh, get that second education in thinking outside the brain more than ever now because the gap between what our brain alone, the biological brain, the unassisted brain, what it can do, uh, the gap between what it can do and what we ask of it these days is big and it's getting bigger. Um, you know, the, the, the biological brain evolved to do certain things that are different from what we ask it to do these days. It evolved to do things like um, move the body. It evolved to uh, navigate th through three-dimensional landscapes. It evolved to interact with um, with other people. And these things it can do effortlessly and easily. Um, things like dealing with manipulating symbols and thinking about abstract ideas, those are really hard to do for the brain. And yet that's what constitutes most of our, our you know, knowledge workers. That con that's what constitutes our days. So the brain, it's difficult for the brain to do those things. The gap is big and getting bigger, as I mentioned. So the, the way to transcend that is to get better at thinking outside the brain, to get better at, um, at extending the mind. Well, so it's a good... Um segue into um, where you spend a lot of your time is just talking about productivity and, and creativity. And that's clearly in the in the arena of our mission at Indeed, which is helping people get jobs. And in particular, we spend a lot of time now thinking about the, the future of work. And um, so one of the things that you do talk about is using the body to create these contexts uh, to help us think better. And can you talk a little bit about what you know, what we've learned in recent decades about the relationship between, you, know, you mentioned hand gestures around bodily movement and cognition. Sure. Yeah. You know, and this is uh, another way in which this book ended up, uh, as all my books seem to end up being a kind of cultural critique, you know, because um, our culture tends to separate mind and body, you know, to elevate mind above body and to assume that the body has nothing intelligent to add to our thinking processes. But research in uh, a field known as embodied cognition is is um, demonstrating that that's very much not the case. Um, before I talk about gestures and movement, I think I'll just mention um, one other uh, one additional really interesting aspect of thinking with the body, which is interoception. Um, that is um, a sort of fancy scientific word for our capacity to tune into our internal signals and cues. Um, that's something that we don't do very often during our really busy days. We're so focused on all the um, all the stimuli coming at us uh, from the external world. It's easy to forget that we have this internal world as well, where the signals are quite a bit more you know quiet and subtle, but they're always there, that flow of internal signals. And those uh, internal cues and signals actually carry a lot of wisdom, a lot of stored experience um, that we miss out on if we if we're not tuned in to our um, in our interoceptive sense. So that's one way in which uh, the body can guide our thinking. Another is, as I mentioned, gesture. Um, gesture, if we think about it at all, we tend to think of it as a kind of clumsy add on to uh, verbal expression. You know, we tend to elevate the importance of of verbal expression in our culture and to assume that our, our hands don't really have much to say except as maybe to emphasize, you know, or to communicate with other people, which they certainly do. But what's interesting uh, about the, the research on gesture is that uh, our own gestures are actually part of our own thinking process as well. And in fact, far from being a kind of tag along to verbal language, it's usually the case that our gestures are a few milliseconds ahead of where um, our verbal expression is. Um, and when people are inhibited from gesturing, their speech is less fluid, their thinking is less cogent, they're less able to explain complicated concepts or solve problems. So um, you could really think of our gestures as making this loop between uh, our brains and, and our hands. And that loop is where a lot of um, good thinking happens. Um, the last thing I'll just mention, Chris, is um, the importance of movement uh, to thinking. And again, like our culture has this idea that if you really want to do serious thinking, real thinking, then you sit down and you're still, you know, until you get it done. Um, and that can be uh, it can be a very frustrating prescription. I'm thinking especially for for students and young people, but it's also not very effective. Um, you know, human intelligence evolved um, in the crucible of, of movement, really, you know, when you think about 
um, the kind of activities that our forebears engaged in, like foraging and hunting, those were cognitively complex and they were physically demanding at the same time. So um, movement and thinking, far from being separated, have always been really intricately interwoven in human evolutionary history. And it's still the case that um, movement helps us think in a number of ways in terms of keeping us alert and energized, um, in terms of uh, expressing some some uh, concepts and ideas that are hard to um, hard to capture in words, um, and then also in terms of bringing people together. You know, it's there's lovely research that shows that when people um, walk together, they fall into a kind of synchronized rhythm, and that helps to. Um, create a sort of common mindset that allows them to cooperate and um, and collaborate together more easily. So uh, I, it's my view that we should be looking uh, at every every chance we get to incorporate movement into our workday rather than say, you know, again, separating it and saving, say, your your gym workout for after work. We should be building movement breaks into into the workday itself. Yes, yeah, so you you start uh, the book actually talking about taking a walk and 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 just this idea of of taking a break from from work which we think of as not productive but that it actually could be an essential aspect of productivity and, and I kind of wanted to maybe try to 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 bring in something else which might or might not work and so so tell me if I'm if I'm uh, missing something here but uh, so for example during the pandemic my, my wife and I had both been New York Times crossword puzzle fans for many years and when the pandemic started we were suddenly at home every single night in the same bed every single night, which which we hadn't been for many years from all this travel. So we started doing the, the Times Crossword Puzzle together. Uh, I think we're on uh, day 680 uh, of our streak right now of doing it every single day. One of the things that's clear, if you're anyone that does the, the Times Crossword Puzzle, is that puzzles get harder throughout the week. Um, Saturdays are, are the hardest ones. And almost always on Saturday, we don't finish in one sitting. And this Saturday, we were we were working on it. We got through the southwest corner was just brutal. And it was a whole bunch of just facts that you either knew or you didn't know. There was no way we were going to get it. We set it aside. We came back three hours later. And in five minutes, it was done. And so and that happens all the time. And so one question that I have is so it clearly, you know, you talk about just taking a break and and walking and doing something physical as a way. But to where where is there a line between doing something versus and and I'll bring one other thing so I I'm a I'm a baker I I make sourdough bread and this I like I love this idea of fermentation and I like I think of my brain at, and ideas as needing to ferment that sometimes what they need that actually time is an essential ingredient and that things need to be left alone and that they do it's kind of like the muscle analogy that doesn't work that that certain ideas do not yield to headlong assault so yes. So, so what is what is the relationship, I guess, between between movement, but also actually just leaving things alone and coming back to them, and how does that all? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned um, that um, brain as muscle metaphor again, because I think that's where we go wrong a lot of times. We there's this, uh, you know, wonderful idea of the growth mindset introduced by Carol Dweck, the like the Stanford psychologist, that suggests that the brain is like a muscle, and the more we exercise it, the stronger it gets, the smarter we get. Um, and that's a, it's a very hopeful and optimistic concept and, and um, one that's helpful to a lot of people. Um, but I do want to suggest that it's limited in the, in the sense that we're still it's still it's still neurocentric. It's still saying it's still really only allowing the brain a role to play. Um, and it can give people the idea that, um, you know, to to get something done again, you just you kind of have to sit there and work your brain until it um, it produces the results that you want. And this often leads to frustration, to um, to kind of an impasse, you know, like when you couldn't finish the puzzle. Um, and so that's where I think the extended mind can come in and, and make a few a few suggestions. One is that often changing the context um, is more useful than sort of a top down, you know, trying to influence your brain. Uh, directly, it's it's more effective to kind of change what's around you. Um, you may have you and your wife may have come back to um, to that crossword puzzle in a different state, a different physical state, a different emotional or psychological state that made it easier for you to solve the problem. I think there was also probably some uh, activity by what's known as the default network, which is um, the part of the brain that's kind of um, 
that takes over when we're not intently focused on on one thing. Um, and so you 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 guys start you know you started the process um, of, of rumination and, and reflection um, in your first go round with the, with the crossword puzzle. And even as you went off and did other things, your brain was your brains were sort of working still to um, to to solve those puzzles. And so when you sat back down, you know it it seems miraculous, but really. Um, it, the, I think that's the trick is sort of working with the brain as it is rather than imposing ideas about how the brain should work. You know, we've got to work with this, the, the brain as it is, which is this limited, quirky, idiosyncratic biological organ that evolved in certain ways. That's what we've got. That's what we've, what we've all got. You know, it's not this isn't a question of smart, individual differences, smarter, not so smart. It's this. These are universal um characteristics and universal limits of the human brain. And, and the extended mind, I think, is very wise in terms of working with the brain and the, and the rest of us um, as we are. It's very wise in terms of understanding our nature as human beings. We'll come back a little later, just but even that concept of, of smart versus not so smart. We have, a, we have a way that we think to measure that, which could be academically or performance at work. But given everything else that you're talking about, there's a whole bunch of other factors that could play into that that could give certain people advantages or, or disadvantages. Um, so I, I want to get back to, I, I think you mentioned this earlier, but one of the things that you you talk about is this idea of offloading and, and the role of that place. And that's another one that I was explaining to my wife this weekend, and she got super excited because she is... Um, she is a sort of spatial thinker. So she her her desk for 20 years in our old home was the dining room table. And she just always had to have, she's a writer and she's she's currently in graduate school right now. She has to have all of her things laid out in very specific piles. She was a, a, a she was a librarian, she was a cataloger for many years. And so she thinks in terms of visual organization. Um and and then uh in, in her office now, she has her desk is just a 12 foot long board where she has oh, wow. all these things laid and she just needs. And so when I was when I was reading this, I was I was telling her and she got super excited about this idea that she wasn't just being strange, that this is actually it, it works for her. So can you can you talk yeah. about offloading? What What is offloading and how does that help us? Yeah, Chris, it sounds like your wife is way ahead of everybody. She's already she's already there. Um yeah, so uh, cognitive offloading is this idea that um, rather than keep ideas and, and pieces of information inside our heads, we really want to get them out onto physical space um, whenever possible. And that could be a big board like the one your, your wife has or, or a, a table with uh, things spread out, or it could be a bunch of post-it notes that you move around. It could be a multi-monitor setup where you have a lot of uh, space in terms of computer screens, computer monitors. Um, and there's a lot of advantages, it turns out, to uh, not doing things in our heads. And again, our culture tends to tell us that smart people, you know, geniuses, they do it in their heads. But in fact, for all of us, uh, it's often more efficient and more effective to, to download, to offload uh, our mental contents. And then we are able to interact with them in a new way. You know, first of all, we get some distance between ourselves and our ideas. We all know that um, somehow when we when we are writing something and we print it out and we see it on paper, it, we can um, we interact with it differently. Right. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't make sense from like a computer point of view, but this is how human intelligence works, that um, the context in which we encounter information really matters for our thinking um, when we engage in cognitive offloading and we we um, turn uh object, uh, turn ideas and in pieces of information into objects that we can manipulate like post-it notes. And I am a prolific post-it note user. Um, that's another way that we're drawing on what is easy and effortless for the brain, this kind of physical manipulation, this manipulation of physical objects, rather than, again, keeping ideas in this abstract form that is difficult for the, the brain to keep track of. I mean, for one thing, when we keep everything in our head, there's some amount of mental bandwidth that's being absorbed just in terms of just in uh, that's being eaten up just by kind of keeping those things in mind, you know, and we, we when we set down that burden, when we put um, ideas and information um, into physical form, then we free up bandwidth to to think in, in sort of higher ways and more imaginative ways. Um, because we're not engaging our brains in that simple task of just remembering and keeping track, you know. And one more thing, and I wonder if your your wife has, if she takes advantage of this as well, is that once we offload 
ideas and information from our heads and put them out there into physical space. We can use all these embodied resources um, that are, again, sort of our birthright as human beings. For example, our spatial memory. You know, we have a really keen spatial memory that comes from the fact that we had to remember where things were, where food was, where threats were, you know. But now we can apply that to pieces of information and to ideas and um, draw on our spatial memory to remember that, oh, these things go over here, these things are over there, you know, these kinds of embodied resources that are wasted effectively when we keep all our thoughts and ideas in our heads. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, there's, there's so much she, she's going to need to read your book because I think that she, she really, well, also, I mean, she, she yeah. taking, taking walks is an essential part of her writing and thinking process and, mm -hmm. and, and always has been. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, well, so I, you mentioned uh, geniuses before. And, and so in, in this, in this, conversation around what actually is smart or what is genius you you talk about the the minds of of experts not actually as as superstars and as geniuses but people who are particularly adept at experimenting at, at testing and backtracking and and so one of the things you know we we talk about this a lot at indeed that um with respect to creativity that the the greatest enemy to innovation is certainty and that mm. that what I what I always say is that as soon as we think we have the answer, that's when curiosity dies. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the way that we work is is hypothesis, experimental design, and then you know unemotional analysis of the results, and then repeat over and over and over again. So can you talk about what what the research shows about this idea of expertise and what what makes someone good at solving these types of problems? Yeah, yeah, I think this this is another kind of misconception that the, the book addresses another kind of misconception we have about what makes for a smart person, an expert, a genius. And we have this idea, again, that um, a genius does it in their heads, you know, that um, like chess masters who can can play out whole games in their heads or memory champions who can remember, you know, all the digits of pi or something um, in, in, and keep track of them in their heads. Um, but in fact, in the in the real world, you know, experts are often the people who know how to think outside the brain. They are the experts are more likely to involve their bodies in their thinking. They're more likely to use space um, in the way some of the ways that your your wife was uh, that you were describing. Your wife does. They're more likely to draw on the social resources that are available to them. Um, and I think it's it's actually a, given that that is what experts do, that's a good reason to incorporate training or education and thinking outside the brain into uh, how we uh, train novices and how we educate learners um, and beginners, because um, we're giving them a false impression, you know, of, of what expertise is, that it's it's all in the head and not out here in the world, as you were saying, experimenting um, seeing, you know, trying things out, backtracking, seeing what happens and then iterating again. Um, I really think we have some some um, misimpressions and some misconceptions about how uh, genius and how expertise develops that we could stand to correct. So um, I, I'd love to move on to what is probably right now, at least in the in the business world, the currently the most intensely speculated on and debated topic, which is the future of work. Um, and so much of of my reading of of your work, and I, I described this when we were meeting last week, uh, you know, I could summarize as we're wrong about everything. Um, and so so let's start with how we have been working for generations and generations, which is sitting at desks in offices. And your assertion in part is that because we've misunderstood the metaphor we use for the mind, that we've built these entire environments, which make it actually harder for us to, to think. So how does, how does what you find in your research help us to understand what's wrong with how we work and what a better work environment would look like? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, the the pandemic has obviously been a, a huge tragedy. I think it's also um, potentially an opportunity to re-examine the ways that we were working, whether they were really effective, and if not, uh, how might we reinvent the workplace? We have this really unusual opportunity to do that. Um, you know, and uh, um, 
if if the pandemic brings about the end of the open office, I think that will be that will actually be, that will be a blessing. Um, you know, I write uh, I, there's quite a, a, a long section in my book about um, the the particular hell that that is the open office and why it's so um, opposed to um, all the ways in which, again, we're wired as biological creatures Um uh, why why it gets in the way of the kind of complex cognition that um, that most of us need to be doing in our in our daily work lives. You know, the open office is full of um, exactly the kind of stimuli that distract us most, and we are um, by nature distractible creatures because a distraction could have meant a, a, an opportunity or a threat. So we're really we're really wired to be distracted, and this is another way in which I think. We blame ourselves. Um, we we see uh, an individual failing when really it's it's that our our workplace practices and settings are not supporting the way the brain really operates. So, you know, and more than that, the open office is full again of exactly the kind of stimuli that's most distracting. You know, social stimuli. We're we're incredibly social species. We're attuned to what other people are saying. We there's interesting research that suggests that. It's especially distracting to hear just one half of a conversation, like if someone's on the phone, because uh, it's in uh, the the nature of the brain that we're always predicting what will come next, and it's harder to predict when um, we're only hearing one half of the conversation. So we it's it's uh, it uses up uh, you know a lot of mental bandwidth to have all these conversations or half conversations going on around us. Um, so you know now and then, of course, there's um, the question of of working at home, which um, and how we balance that with coming into the office, which I know a lot of uh, workplace managers and leaders are wrestling with right now. And one idea that I find particularly useful in that regard is this concept of um, uh, of intermittent collaboration. And that this is re- this research finds that we we don't do our best thinking when we're isolated and on our own all the time but we also don't do our best thinking when we're in constant collaboration and constant contact with other people instead we we get our freshest ideas and our our most effective solutions when we oscillate between those two uh, ways of working and thinking you know this deep deep work this sort of protected um this uh work time that's protected from social influence um, but then also this kind of intensive um, collaboration with other people when we can move back and forth between those two ways of working. And so then I think the question becomes, how do we create spaces and how do we create social practices that support those two very distinct kind of work, uh, ways of working? I think it's possible that, um, you know, our new kind of hybrid arrangements might support this um, intermittent collaboration model really well if our if our home, our time working at home became that kind of protected space, if we can do that, if we can, you know, pr- wall people off a bit from all the distractions that are coming at them from, from their jobs, um, and then turn the office into a space that is really um, conducive to that kind of um, very intensive collaboration, I think we might be able to get the best of both worlds that way. Yeah, and for, for full disclosure, so Indeed has had only open offices since the, <laughs> since the day the company started, I've never had, no one has an office. Um, and, and then well, you've, you've done pretty well. And then we spent it. the last two years completely isolated at home. So we've, it sounds like we've been doing uh-huh. everything totally wrong. So the, I guess the good news is it's all, uh, uphill from here. Uh, uh-huh. but we are like a lot of people really thinking about what, what is an office for right now? And so there's a, a, a whole bunch of research that points very clearly in the, in the, the struggle between, uh, people wanting people to come back to an office and and people not wanting to come back to an office is that mm-hmm. there's a big mm-hmm. disconnect between what what management wants which by and large uh-huh. when you read the surveys is they want people to come back to the office for quote productivity and when mm-hmm. you ask employees what they want out of an office experience it's connection and uh-huh. so mm-hmm. The difference between those two is actually going to be the source of a huge amount of trouble when people are being mm. asked to come back to an office for for different reasons. But I guess that this is it's a huge opportunity for us to rethink as we're bringing mm-hmm. people back, as everyone else is, um, mm-hmm. what what mm-hmm. that looks like. And so one thing, though, that comes under that and it's very clear from what we saw during the pandemic is that different people definitely have different styles. For some people, mm. they are would describe themselves as extroverts. They 
need connection on a regular basis and they felt on top of global pandemic mm. and social unrest and everything mm. else they felt really isolated for some other people this was kind of a dream come true they really just wanted to be mm -hmm. able to to to, mm -hmm. to think and not be bothered mm -hmm. and so one of the things you you talk about this idea of uh extension inequality and mm -hmm. that um mm. that you know, the structure of our society is based on these assumptions that some people can think more intelligently than, than others. And maybe mm -hmm. that's not true, mm -hmm. but people think differently. How, can you talk about that that concept a little bit? And how does that maybe play into how we would think about what workplaces um, could be designed like? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for asking about that, Chris, because I, I do think that's a really um, that's a really important idea. And just to go back for a moment to your your point about individual differences in, in how people responded to the changes um, induced by the pandemic. I do think that the the finding in the research that kind of bridges that um, those two very disparate reactions uh, responses is the finding that people think best when they're in spaces where they feel empowered and they feel in control, you know, and that if, if there is a sense in which many um, employees don't want to return to the office, I think we have to ask why. Maybe the office the office was not serving them. Maybe they didn't feel, and maybe we now can help make them feel that their space in the office is is in some way um, it it belongs to them that they they're in control that they're empowered in that space, and that may mean that an, an, an extrovert is empowered to you know invite all kinds of people into their space and interact with them. It may mean that. And an introvert is um, is empowered to to shut people out and to be um, to to have that quiet time that they need. Um, but um, to this question of extension inequality, um, I do think that it's a real contrast to our to our um, conventional conception of intelligence being a lump of stuff, bigger or smaller, you know, that is sealed inside the head. When we start thinking about Actually, the, the intelligence of our thinking depends very much on the quality of the raw materials that we have to think with and how well we know how to use those things. Then, as I say, the quality of, of those raw materials and um, what people know about how to use them become instrumental, you know, a constitutive of, of people's ability to think intelligently. And I think once you start thinking about an extension inequality, you you it's it's hard not to um, come to the conclusion that um, the raw materials for thinking are in no way distributed equitably in our society. You know, starting with what we were just talking about, how many workers have have control and an empowering sense of of um, of control over over where they work. You know not as many as we would like. How many people uh, in the workplace have freedom to move their bodies around? How many people in the workplace have access to green spaces, to um, to well-designed, um, beautiful spaces? You know, it, it should be all of us, but it's not. How many people have access to um, to caring mentors, you know, or um, ambitious and driven and inspiring peers? You know, all of these things really matter for how well we can think. And we should be incorporating um, the fact of extension inequality into the way that we assess people, into the way that we understand people's challenges and people's strengths. So at the at the very end of of the book, you tell the story about Joshua Aronson, um, who happens to be from from Austin, where where I am, um, and his idea of the the stereotype threat study. Um, can you talk about how that study? helps us understand as, as you um, lay out in the very end of the book that the extended mind might lead us to embrace the extended heart. Yeah, yeah. So I, I do love the story about uh, Joshua Aronson uh, who, that I tell in the book that he, he, when he was in graduate school, he had a very imposing and very intimidating uh, graduate advisor. And Josh said that um, whenever he was in the presence of this very um, intimidating professor, his own IQ would drop by 20 points. And I, I love that story because I think we all have had that experience. And um, uh, Josh was saying this is, you know, this we might call this a kind of situational intelligence. Like we the idea that we have one IQ score that is the same all, at all times in every place just doesn't track with our own experience that we can be really intelligent in some situations and really stupid in others, you know? So that really argues for the creation of smart situations, you know, um, intelligent situations that support our ability to think well. Um, 
And one, and and then, uh, so that was in graduate school and, and Joshua Aronson went on to, with Claude Steele, come up with this um, very important um, landmark kind of idea in psychology and social psychology, stereotype threat, which is the idea that um, people who are members of group that are, groups that are negatively stereotyped um, are, are, they're aware of these stereotypes, you know, they're, they're, um, at their, they become almost hypervigilant, kind of looking for cues that tell them that others are, are judging them in this, um, this stereotyped and prejudiced way. And that actually, that monitoring and that, that anxiety um, uses up a fair amount of mental bandwidth in itself and ends up diminishing um, the, um, the performance of people who are subject to stereotype threats. So that um, there's so many ways to go with that, but it, one in particular that has special relevance for the extended mind is um, is that psychologists have started to talk about not just prejudiced people, like prejudice inside people's minds, but actually prejudiced places that often, um, you know, these stereotypes um, and these messages about groups of people are embedded in the spaces that we um, that we occupy schools and workplaces and other other public spaces. Um, so we need to be really attuned to whether there are cues of, of identity and belonging represented um, in people's in the spaces where people do their thinking, because those kinds of cues send a really important message about whether you'll succeed in this place, whether um, you'll be welcome in this place. And um, I think that's a, a different way of thinking about stereotyping and prejudice than we than we traditionally have had keep talking about this for a very long time, but we have to wrap up. So I, I, I always start with the the question of how are you doing? And I always end with the same question, which is um, when you look through the lens of, of the last couple of years and all of mm. what we've collectively been through, is there anything from that experience that has left you with some optimism for the future? Yes, um, there is. And I think that um, the you know the pandemic and the way that it cut us off from many of the mental extensions that help us to think um, prince you know most significantly in person interaction with other people but also it cut many of us off from our the physical workspace from our offices which might have been arranged in ways that helped it help us think um, it even in some ways cut us off from our bodies I know many of us felt like we were hour after hour sitting, you know, feeling like like a, a, a head in a box, you know, like a brain in a vat um, after in being in Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting. Um, and I think we many of us felt that we were not thinking at our best during the pandemic. And I think it it helped the fact that we were cut off from many of these mental extensions that in normal times help us think. I think that that helped to make the extended mind more visible than it was before. Um, it helped to make the extra neural resources that assist our thinking. Um, it helped us recognize how very important they are. And now as we um, kind of um, approach something, you know, something like normal, we can, um, we can welcome those mental extensions back into our lives and also think in a really intentional and skillful way about um, how to use them um, to to enhance our thinking even more. Well, Annie, thank you so much for joining me today and for sharing this uh, amazing work. And um, thank you for everything you do to help uh, us as a species understand a little bit better how it is that we uh, we think and learn. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. This has really been fun. Mm -hmm.